Ich habe gerade was von Ihnen gehört. Ich habe schon von Ihnen gehört. Ich habe schon Okay, uh, it is 6.30. This is January 24th, the Sutton Finance and Warren Advisory Committee. And we'll start tonight's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so tonight is a, uh, a public hearing uh, to review the, the warrant for the uh, special town election on uh, February 12th. Um, so we'll open, it's uh, 6.31, we'll open the uh, public hearing and we'll begin with uh, Jim Smith, the uh, town administrator, if you can give us sure. a brief overview and lead us through the warrant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, um, this is a unique circumstance, obviously, for the town of Sutton. We very rarely have uh, special town meetings. We have a, a, obviously a spring and a, a fall town meeting. Uh, but an opportunity presented itself uh, early in the month of January where we got approached by a manufacturing company, Prime Metals, out of Worcester area. Uh, they currently have uh, two uh, manufacturing facilities in the city of Worcester, uh, and they would like to combine the facilities into one uh, state-of-the-art uh, manufacturing facility um, and we were told that Sutton is on the short list uh, for this potential company. Uh, the only problem was the time frame. Uh, they needed to be able to make a decision in the uh, late February, March time frame and obviously Maytown meeting uh, makes discussion of a, a TIF uh, deal impossible uh, or, or not probable for the company at the very least. So. Um, uh, Jen Hager and I uh, work together to negotiate the TIF with the company, uh, and we'll talk about that at a later time. Um, but, uh, you know, we really would like to uh, try to do everything we can to attract this company. It's, it's, it's a great use, um, and uh, they're going to invest over $25, 28000000 million in this manufacturing company, and we'd like to, you know, we'd like to do everything we can to attract this company. Um, they have a PowerPoint presentation, so if it's okay with the board, I'll call them up. They can do the PowerPoint, then you can ask questions, and, and then we can go on to address the other items on the warrant, if that's okay, unrelated to prime metals. Sure, and, and could you at some, either before or after that presentation, explain the terms of the TIF? I will. I, I, we've, we've done this before, before the Board of Selectmen, and, yep. and the you know, uh, Lynn Tokarczyk is their consultant. She comes up and she does this PowerPoint with Kevin Steen from the company. Um, at the end, uh, she will mention the TIF process, and then I will talk about the TIF deal that we negotiated with them. Great. Okay. If that's all right. Good evening, everyone. As this is um, starting to show on the screen. Okay. Uh, but I'm Lynn Tokarczyk. I am Prime Metals Government Incentives Consultant, their TIF consultant. And I am here with uh, Kevin Osteen, who's the Treasurer and Tax Director of Prime Metals. So we thought we'd give you a a brief presentation, uh, basically in three components. One will be the background and history of the company. The second will be the company's proposed expansion plans. And then third, the company's interest in uh, tax incentives. Um, so first of all, I'd really like to thank the Finance Committee for inviting us tonight. Um, and for the Board of Selectmen, we met with the Board of Selectmen last week and for their unanimous support for this particular TIF proposal. Um, and for Jim Smith and his leadership in attracting and being very interested in bringing a new manufacturer here to the town of Sutton, as well as Jen Hager. Jen is phenomenal. I've worked with her in the past um, over the years and uh, her dedication and assistance is um, beyond words. So thank you so much, Jen. And uh, we really appreciate uh, the local officials' efforts to work with the company um, in their timeline. So I'm going to turn it right over to Kevin. So here we are with the presentation. 
And thank you. Uh, Kevin Epson with the company. I've been with the company for about three and a half years. And, uh, but uh, Prime Metals has been in this area since the late 1800s. So they used to be called Morgan Construction back in the day. And they've been in the Worcester area since 1888. In 2008, they got purchased by Siemens. And in 2015, Prime Metals bought this from Siemens, basically. And Prime Metals is owned by Mitsubishi Heavy and still has ownership by Siemens. So we're a joint venture between the two. Um, but been in the area a long time and looking to hopefully stay in the area. Um, to give you an idea of the type of customers we have, we have U.S. Steel, Nucor Steel, steel manufacturers, Hyundai Steel, ArcelorMittal, DeFasco, they are steel makers. Um, they make a wide range of, of items. We help do cars, like the aluminum, the, not the aluminum, the, uh, yeah, the aluminum cars, like Ford. So the idea behind what our customers, so we help manufacturers of steel manufacture steel, so we're the front end of it. But here the manufacturing plant also does morgoils and bearings and parts. Um, but here in Worcester, the, the facility here has done over 600 patents over the years. Um, this is these pictures represent the factory here in Worcester, um, ranging from steel rods to coils. Um, they, uh, we aren't seeing any of the machining pieces, but this is what we do here in uh, Worcester. And then the next slide kind of goes into what our customers make when we help them build their plants. So from the top, you see it's springs in your mattresses uh, to barbed wire to fencing and corrugated things, you know, car paneling, uh, rebar, any of those kinds of items. And the next thing that some people like to see is back in the day, our manufacturers helped people build the Golden Gate Bridge, the Hoover Dam. So all of our products get into these these various uh, creative items. So as Jim was saying, basically right now we're in a leased facility. Our offices are leased in the WPI Institute and then our manufacturing plant is over across the street from the Bank 16. We are looking to get all of it under one roof. Uh, the facility and uh, the manufacturing plant has been there for over 100 years and it is not meeting any of our needs. It's not efficient. So I think we're currently in about 260,000 square feet and we're looking to get into about 183,000 square feet. So streamline the operations, make it more efficient, just make the manufacturing process better and get the office there also. Right, one of the items that's very important to the company when they're looking for a new one state-of-the-art facility is they're trying to retain their talent. So you might wanna talk about yeah, that. So you know, we, we've looked in several areas outside of Massachusetts, several areas in Massachusetts, and as Jim said, it, the, the short, some of the short list is definitely Sutton. And Sutton is key to us because we could retain our talent. It's close enough where we're not gonna lose a lot of people. Um, another factor that I, I wanna mention is a lot of our workforce is um, closer to retirement age, and so we're going to need to re, you know, recruit individuals, and so this is also a good location for the universities and the schools in the area. Mm -hmm. and, and it is very competitive um, because the company attracts a lot of engineers and the like, millennials, you know, they want everything at their fingertips <laughs> and they want a state-of-the-art facility. Um, the, the building that they're currently in for manufacturing is over 100 years old, so yes. you can imagine. Uh, the, so their employees are dictating to the executives of what they're looking for. Yeah, so this facility would be, the, the estimated facility is 183,000 square feet. It would become our corporate headquarters. Our CEO would be housed here. Uh, our R&D is done here in the manufacturing operations. And as Jim was saying, you see a breakdown there of what the potential investment is looking to do. You also see a picture of the site. And I think we have a better picture next on the location. Um, we have done site drawings for the site. We've done some uh, studies and feasibility to make sure it all works, and it, it seems fine for the need. There's an, a design, conceptual design. I think there's, those are solar panels, I believe. I, I believe those are still uh, the idea to put those on there, but that is a conceptual design, and then the next one also is kind of another side. Oh, I think I wasn't here for the last meet the meeting last week, but my understanding is some of the concerns were the noise. We do not have noise. You don't really hear noise outside the building. 
We don't, we're not a large consumer of, of resources in the community. Mon we just use water for the people and their needs. Um, uh, a truck, uh, it's about 10 trucks a day on average. So it's not a lot, of, it's not a distribution center. We don't have a lot of movement. The biggest thing is the, you know, the people, the number of people and them getting to and from the office. Mm -hmm. So that's, so it's, we're not a huge, impact or drain on the on the community um, the idea is uh, it's a retention idea is to retain the permanent jobs from which we're moving here uh, the types of jobs that we have at our facility here now including the CEO would be the engineering machinists the manufacturing quality control project management logistics administration um, and the the wage base is definitely is, is up there and in line I think or above what you guys would be looking for. Uh, we were asked also to, to prepare, you know, what impact do we have on the local uh, businesses and hotels and restaurants and things of that nature. So we did an estimated $3 million on what we're doing currently, and that would continue and only grow. We have visitors coming in from our, you know, our international parents and owners to our customers, our international customers and customers from all over. But we have people here visiting weekly um, and we would be using all of these restaurants, hotels, establishments. We use industrial, you know, from paper to janitorial to everything local. Mm -hmm. um, we, the company has a long history of being a part of the community. Uh, we definitely are involved in charitable organizations. We are partnered with the schools in the area and co-ops and vocational schools, we get our talent from these relationships that we have. And we have many members of our, um, many employees that are also a part of boards and organizations in the area and the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next slide, just to more or less recap, um, this would really be for Sutton to attract and keep a long-standing manufacturer in Central Mass. Obviously for the company, it's all about retaining their talent and uh, developing an underutilized property. You know, right now the town's collecting taxes on the land. Um, so once a new building is constructed, that's going to increase new real estate tax revenue for the town. Also bringing in permit fees as a result of the construction, um, an increase in meals taxes, hotel taxes. Um, I've heard could be opportunities where additional hotels might be looking to uh, expand in the region. Um, so just to, cons you know, just to recap that, you know, the company, as I mentioned, they've got, they're so committed and dedicated to community involvement and hopefully you think they're a great corporate neighbor. So just to l talk a little bit about the tax incentives, what's before you and what would eventually, um, with your support tonight, um, go before town meeting. Um, this is a tool, a state tool known as the Economic Development Incentive Program which the town has used approximately six, six other times to retain or attract businesses. And the state allows municipalities to participate in offering municipal real estate taxes incentives. The state would, uh, the company would be eligible to benefit from a statutory state tax credit because they're a manufacturer in Massachusetts. And so on the muni municipal side, the local tool is tax increment financing. And the uh, tax increment financing, the acronym is a TIF, um, T-I-F. And so basically how this works, as you know, is the town doesn't lose a dime on the existing taxes, which is the land. And as a result of the company putting up a new building, that's going to increase the assessed value and therefore generate new tax revenue. So that's the piece, the new taxes only that the town would offer tax incentives uh, to the company. And it's a, so it's essentially, it's a discount on future taxes. And it can be offered a minimum of five years, a maximum of 20 years, a minimum exemption in any given year of 1%, and a maximum exemption of 100%. So it ultimately is bringing new tax revenue as a result of the project if the company doesn't decide to locate here, you're still going to collect your land taxes. If the company does decide to locate here, you would still continue to collect your land taxes plus 
a significant hiccup in your tax revenue. And uh, so I will now turn it over to, uh, to Jim. And again, we appreciate um, Jim and Jen. They have really, they've been so receptive um, to attracting the company and have worked in um, incredible timelines, um, you know, to have this potentially be on the warrant for um, town meeting is um, exceptional and we really appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Jim, bef before you get into the numbers, may, may I just ask a question yeah, please. about yep. the, the presentation? And Linda, I may have to go to Jen, but through you, just to tell me because I, I don't know you know all the roads around there. So Jen or Linda here, where exactly is this located on Joe Moore? Is it the last lot before you'd get to uh, Minden Road? I just I, I was trying to turn the picture upside down so I could <laughs> understand where it was. So um, again, I, if you don't, I, 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 do you mind if I a a ask Jen? Oh no, please <laughs> do. So uh, uh, traffic in and out. Are they going to? Are you going to open up the road down there so that your no. traffic goes on to Minden? No, I. It, it'll no, come in and out the way all the traffic does now. That the existing access road that goes out to Minden is registered as emergency access only and nothing changes about that. Great. All right. I, I now know where it is. Thank you. Okay. How many employees? 275. Okay. Approximately. Have, w um, in terms of the environmental impact, in terms of waste or anything like that, w chemical, are there any chemicals involved? So we don't use hazardous chemicals. We have no waste. Okay. We, uh, I think we have grease, I guess, for the components of the equipment, but yeah. that's it. But we don't, we don't discharge anything. Uh, no hazardous materials whatsoever. Okay. okay. So the, uh, the, the, the there's limited pretreatment of the sewer that will end up down in the sewer treatment facility. The only thing that should be going in the sewer is human waste. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. Okay. So what? What do you manufacture? If I heard you uh, correct, Kevin, you said you don't manufacture, uh, maybe, maybe I didn't hear you right. You don't manu manufacture anything on site, but you have 183,000 no. square feet? No, we do manufacture on site. Sorry. Sorry for the confusion. So we, it's more oils and bearings and there's machinists and uh, tools. And then they also do the coil that you saw, that orange oh. coil, uh, which is a high speed thing. I don't n really know what they use that for. I believe they use that for the manufacturing of springs and mattresses. Um, but here, the workforce, the major I would say there are 120 office folks and the rest are manufacturing folks. Okay. Right, and just in the company, what in all simple terms, they're, they're a manufacturer of equipment sure. for the steel industry and steel rolling machines for the customers then to make products. So that's, you know. We make the equipment so that they can make it. And that it, some of that is made here in the facility. Okay. We do have a lot of CNC machines. If you're familiar with machining at all, CNC is computer operated, highly skilled operators who are proficient not only in um, 3D engineering plans, um, but also in computer applications that they have to be proficient in. You're really cutting large sheets of steel and and assembling those into machines for their clients who then make true steel, like the, the rods and that yeah. go into uh, floors for reinforcement or wals for reinforcement or in the hinges and the inner, uh, you know, bridge okay. elements. So they're, they're right. cutting and making parts that become machines that they assemble and then ship to their clients all over the world. Correct. Okay. In fact, most of our uh, manufactured items are shipped outside the U.S., I would say, a large portion. Yeah. Okay. So they are they are literally a designated as an advanced manufacturing mm -hmm. plant. In that site, is there any contingency for potential expansion later on? Do you have? There is. Uh, I don't know from the manufacturing side, to be honest. I don't remember Mike saying that. Uh, you know, being a tax guy, I don't. I don't remember what he said about the manufacturing facility. I know that there's potential for the office to expand. 
uh, being owned by Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi is looking to expand their presence in the Northeast, and they may kind of come in at some point. I'm not talking about a significant expansion. It would be very low, but they're I think, I think we still have some, lot, some land up but there, the don't we? the site has the ability <laughs> to Yes, expand. it does. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if they need more space, we've got it. Right, and that's the attractive, <laughs> one of the attractive components to the company is that it mm -hmm. for, fu for the future, there is capacity. And the truck, you said there's only 10 trucks in and out a day? Yeah. It, we're not, a, we don't, you know, we, it'd be a large piece of equipment that goes out and it takes us, our manufacturing cycle is a very long period of time for this equipment to be very big pieces of stuff. So you're not shipping it daily, that's for sure. So you might, you know, you're going to have these, this 18 wheeler is going to get this big piece of equipment on the truck and take it out at some point. So oh. let me clarify. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're looking at moving completely out of your current facility in Worcester both facilities. to another location, both facilities to another location. Correct. Um, assuming this passes tonight and passes town meeting on February 12th, mm -hmm. what would be, well, I guess it would be the next steps. What could be your time frames? So the goal for Michael, and uh, Michael is the, um, the lead executive here that's responsible for all of this and couldn't make it, I apologize. But he is saying his goal is by March 31st, 2019 to be up and running. The main push for us is the office because of our lease at, there in Worcester ends um, middle of next year, I believe. So the push is get the office space first, but the idea would be have everything up and running by March 31st, 2019. And that's why the aggressive stance now. Right, so that means, what that means is, you know, a shovel would need to go into the ground basically the second quarter of 2018. I'll loan you a shovel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we the only um, town or is Worcester not trying to get this to stay in Worcester or are we looking at other towns or where does the negotiating go? We are looking at other facility, other uh, towns and cities in the area. Yep. And Worcester is trying to get us to stay. Do they not have the space or? They, <coughs> uh, until recently, they did not have a viable site that we could build on. And they still don't technically have a site right now. They've, uh, they've approached, uh, you know, they've approached us that they, they, they should have one by the end of this month. Um, and so we are in discussions with other areas about also other forms. Right, and so what the company's trying to do, they're trying to make some corporate real estate decisions and they're looking at all factors. And so the project needs to make economic and financial sense because this is a global company. They have, um, as Kevin mentioned, they have you know, operations globally, nationally, and then there are many options here in Massachusetts. So similar to, I don't know how many of you were on the finance committee or um, when we did tax at PCA, in the past we have done another tax insurance finance committee on a matter of the PC town meeting in this identical situation. You have an international company like Prime Metals who's trying to make the decision that's best for their company, and we're competing with other individuals. Some of the information you're probably not privy to yet, and I want to share with you is, is when we were negotiating TIF back in the early, late 1999s and the early 2000s, it was kind of a different atmosphere out there in manufacturing, in the industry, things. It's highly competitive now. It is just aggressive, and you might remember at the time, one of the only communities that was offering highly aggressive TIFs, like 100% TIFs, and for long periods of time was Oxford. They were famous for it. They'd just give away the farm and didn't matter. Um, now, we get that kind of competition all the time, everywhere. Devons, Worcester, there's a lot of place, Springfield, they're doing really aggressive TIFs, and even smaller communities like Norton and um, Holden and they're doing very aggressive TIFs. So, um, as uh, Jim will explain, um, the TIF we're looking at is certainly more aggressive than the ones we've seen in years past. It's not as aggressive as the other ones out there because we realize, you know, while we're always gaining on a deal like this, um, we, we need to balance the town's needs and the company's needs, and I think the company realizes that too. So, um, we are competing, we realize we're competing, and we hope not to go down to have the same process we had with access where we really put a foot forward and they made a decision to go elsewhere. We hope this company will, will see as they've already seen how amazing we are and that they really want to be here. 
but um, but we need to do this um, to be to even be competitive. So um, this is a path that um, Jim and I really feel um, is important to go down. Um, and hopefully, the company I believe. Um, was saying they thought they would be making their decisions in the March timeframe this year and deciding where they're going. The goal is to have something in front of the state at their March meeting. Okay. So any kind of anything you move forward with one, so that's the goal. Okay. Yeah, I know okay. that myself as well. I need to talk to my group early in my cycle about the company. The retention of our employees, so we don't want to disrupt the current balance because if so other communities they might be further away so we're gonna we would lose their attrition most likely because they don't want to commute so the goal is to retain as many people if not all of them as possible okay. that's why Sutton is a very very uh, nice area to be in okay. we had a couple members Tom and Diane come in and yeah. Yeah, they don't have any questions I, it's maybe no, I I, I, I I looked up, I had I had pulled up the some of the meeting notes and things, so I had myself and looked over the company's website. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to familiarize myself. So, okay. As far as the TIF, I can go in and explain that. Yeah, please, Courtney. Um, I don't know that I've got a copy in front of you, and I apologize for that. But essentially, we we negotiated. Uh, the company started at I think 74 percent. We came back at 63, and we settled at around 67 uh, percent uh, tax increment financing, which is essentially uh, the percentage off the normal tax rate. So, you know, with the amount of money they're investing in this project to start, you know, purchasing the land and, and the building and the machinery, uh, upwards of 25 million dollars, um, we felt it appropriate to give them 100 uh, percent off in the first couple of years. So they're not going to pay any taxes in the first two years. Obviously, we'll get um, you know, local receipts from inspections and, and the building department, electrical. So we'll get a lot of revenue through that, but there'll be no taxes in the first couple of years. No additional tax. No additional tax. No. We, will, we will always get the property tax uh, for the existing land. Uh, that value of that land will go up. Uh, as well, because it, there's a manufacturing facility going on top of that land versus right now, I'm sure, you know, uh, Nick is here in the assessor's office, but it's, it's assessed now as vacant land. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that assessment goes up if, it's, if the future development is a higher, better use than vacant land. Um, and then the TIF in year, th year three goes down to 5%. The town collects 5% of the tax value which is approximately $16,500. And then it goes down to 90% or 10%, 15%, 20%, and then periodically goes down to uh, 15 years at, and it ends at uh, 25%. In year 16, so the average tax receipt we will receive is $55,000 over the 15 year period. You know, obviously nothing at the start, more at the at the bottom end of the TIF agreement. In year 16, we collect under the current tax rate and everything else approximately $160,000 from this facility. Does that include the property? It does. Jim, can you just, can you just uh, go over that one more time? So is year 16, we're at 100%? That's correct. It's done. That's correct. So it's a 15-year TIF? That's correct. Are you saying 67% is the average discount over the life of the 15 years? Yes. And then you were explaining that it's a, it progressively changes. Yeah, it, it starts as an aggressive uh, for uh, the town and the, and the company gets an advantage, but they're investing a significant amount of money in this facility. And then uh, slowly but gradually, we get more revenue from this facility as they get up and running and uh, get established. Got it. Thank you. Okay. And so the first two years is a zero uh, other than the base level. That's correct. Year three. Did you want to go into some of this? Well. Year 15? Look, yeah, just let me just finish this. So year three, it's. 5%. 5% 5% of the additional value. Okay. Yes. And uh, as I understand, it's some, it's some, and Nick would know about it, some arcane computation in terms of how you get to that, what that value is. Right. 
Well, it, it's essentially the whole the assessment process. The, assess the assessor's office will have to assess the building value when it's completed. In the first couple of years, there'll be no taxes other mm -hmm. than the additional land taxes a as a result of the higher, sure. better use. Yeah. In year three, we collect 5% of the value of that property, including the land. Inclu right, yep. So, and, and that's, that's through an assessment process w where they value the land. Okay. Um, year, year four is 10%. Year five is 15%. Year six is 20%. Year seven is 25%. Year eight is 30%. Year nine is 35%. Year 10 is 40%. Uh, year 11 is 50%. Year 12 is 55. Year 16, uh, I'm sorry, year 13, 13 is 60%. Year 14 is 70%. Year 15 is 75%. Okay. So it starts aggressively at, and, and then it, it weans off over time. So Jim, let me just try one more time. Year three, yeah, they get a 95% discount on the property tax. We get 100% of the, uh, sorry, of the building tax. We get a, assessed the building tax. We collect 100% of the property tax throughout the 15 years. Year four, they get a- For the land, yes, yes. is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's so right. The exemption is just on the incremental tax value. You did consult with the, the assessing office and the proponents did do their due diligence in using um, construction cost values, the size of the building, other facilities that are similar, and they did actually uh, compile, and I can email this to you Please, if you want to yep. look at it in detail, a um, estimate. Uh, current square footage, 183,000 square feet. Base assessed value would be around 579,000 uh, dollars on the land. The incremental value of the building would be about $8,400,000. So, the new market's total assessed value for the whole property would be nine million. Um, you never lose that not about ninety five hundred that's being paid on the land right now, um, and the the incremental tax on a building of that size and that value would be about one hundred thirty nine thousand dollars a year. So when you run through those percentages, do the calculations over a fifteen year term, and let's just say the company wanted a twenty year term, because Sutton has only granted one, uh, has never granted a 20 year SIP. Um, we told the company that, we weren't sure the community's comfort level with that, and we, that was our first negotiation. We backed the term back to 15 years. Um, and then we looked at the aggressiveness of the SIPs that are out there and in the area in the very recent years, took a look at what we've granted in the past and tried to strike a balance. The highest TIF we've granted over the years, average value, we did twice, and we've granted 50% TIFs over the 15-year uh, term in TIFs. So this is not significantly more than the highest TIFs we've granted, but we feel like it's enough to um, indicate the change in the market, the change in competitiveness, and um, show the company, and frankly, um, hopefully the company comes, but even the larger development company, uh, community out there that Sutton is a player and wants companies, good quality companies with good jobs and lots of jobs in our community. So um, if you look at the actual numbers based on those values, over the term of the TIF, the, the company will save about a million four and over the same term will gain almost $700,000 in taxes. So that's what, those are about the numbers Again, estimated. Until it, the building's on the ground, we don't know. But having looked at values at Atlas Box and similar facilities in the area, these numbers look pretty solid. And we did reach out to, to Nick and have him run through these to, just to make sure there were no weird red flags, because obviously the assessing is a huge part of assessing commercial and industrial use. So I'm, I'm happy to email this to you so you can see all the details, um, but those are the uh, approximate numbers yeah. and, and really were definitely compiled very carefully and I'm seem pretty proud. Okay. Okay. Um, in your presentation, Linda, you listed three things. So, so you had the land, which we already understand about the taxes there, but you listed two other things. One was the building and one was uh, property, you know, inside for your, your machines and all those other things there. Is the TIF, is that everything? The, well, the, t 
I was going to say, in Massachusetts, equipment is not subject to tax. Or the manufacturer. Personal property. Personal oh. property is exempt in Massachusetts if the company is classified by the Department of Revenue as, as, as manufacturing. manufacturing. Okay. Yeah. So you would see that with some of your other manufacturing companies here in Sutton if they do not pay. No, I listen to the guy at the golf course who complains about what he pays for all of his property. That's why I... Oh, manufacturer. Yeah. 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 So he doesn't manufacture anything yeah. except the hard time. Yeah. <laughs> so if, if the company, for whatever reason, is sold, um, the TIF stays in place? Yes. With the, the property? Stays with the property? Ta the TIF stays with the taxable parcel. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let me qualify. <laughs> if Prime Metals, if this company, Prime Metals, changes names, uh, goes to Hyundai Metals, <laughs> but they're still doing the same thing, the TIF stays in place. As was the case with Schwann Foods, if Schwann, when Schwann Food left, that if there had been, and there was actually for a number of years, years left on that TIF, it doesn't automatically go to the next thing that comes in there. It, it we actually we need to, to decertify yeah. mm -hmm. that. Okay, so if it just changes names, stays with parents, still doing the same thing, same number of employees. Um, when we, when the Board of Selectmen negotiates the TIF and the Economic Assistance Board and Learning Council at the state level approves it, there's a stipulation. This company, who the part they're the entity pertaining, how many jobs will be retained or produced, and then all these other details. So if the the company that's left there, if Prime Metals goes away or changes, isn't uh, consistent with the terms of the TIF at the state and local level, it's decertified. Um, and there's an annual reporting locally and to the state um, to make sure that everything stays in terms of the TIF. So as was the case with Schwann, Schwann was with us for about six years. When they left, we immediately moved and the state immediately moved to decertify and that TIF stuck. So the company has to stay in the same form. It can change names, but what they're doing has to remain what they're doing or the TIF ceases to operate. Right, and just to okay. piggyback on that, um, that was a great explanation, Jen. In all TIF agreements, there will be a clause to protect the town um, as Jen mentioned, um, should the company not be decide to move or leave, that the town can petition for the state to have the project decertified. State's sure. pretty aggressive with this. Let me give you one example. NEDT, New England Disposal Technologies, great company if anybody's familiar with it and their CEO, um, Mike Robertson, amazing partner in the community, all kinds of assistance with DEP compliance, you name it. They had a number of employees that they were supposed to produce. They were off by less than 10 employees at some point during the TIF. I can't remember which year it was. The state immediately moved to decertify them. They were decertified at the state level, knowing what they have done for the community and what a great partner they've been in this community and the value we've gained from them beyond those very small percentages that were left in those last few years of the TIF the town and the Board of Selectmen decided to retain the last few years of the local TIF. So that was how aggressive the state is about tracking and decertifying. If you're not in compliance with the state terms of your agreement. Right, and it's all about accountability. So there are clauses right in the TIF agreement um, that um, every company that's uh, approved for incentives by municipalities and by the state, they're accountable and they must be in compliance to submit an annual report as Jen mentioned. Mm -hmm. And so the state monitors that uh, and obviously the, the town has access to that as well. Yeah. Jen, uh, you, as you anticipate, you this could actually accelerate some of the available parcels for additional services that would be available. Um, you know, I, I would hope, you know, we're, we're attracting the kind of workforce who may look for the kind of oh, services absolutely. that are in the Worcester area. You heard him allude. I think it was you that alluded to hotels. I mean, we have open parcels on the back side of the Pleasant Valley Crossing parcel that have been looked at for hotels, currently looked at for some housing. So yeah, I mean, if you attract an advanced manufacturing plant that's international of a big size, because PS already works with that with Fox, which is great, because we have that nice synergy. Not only do you attract other companies that work with and in the same realm as those companies, you get the sell-off benefit of the numbers you need to the restaurants to finally pull the trigger um, for some, I wouldn't say some big old hotels, 
but for stuff maybe some smaller boutique hotels but yeah there's always that great show off when you actually get that that um kind of critical um sum of against manufacturers and that sort of thing and so so it it can't hurt at all and it usually helps the show off um development absolutely yeah other questions I think I'm I'm set with that thank you for coming in I hope you guys enjoy it I know it's it's an exciting project so thanks um just just so you know our our what we're going to do with the public hearing tonight, we've got th three other artic mm -hmm. articles on the warrant. We're going to go through those, close the public hearing, and then we'll um, hopefully that won't take too long. Well, thank you for your consideration. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, article 2. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> this um, this article is, is is related to the police station. Um, we went out to uh, to the market to sell bonds for the police station and refinanced and uh, refunded some additional bonds. Uh, we received a premium on the police station uh, bonds in the amount of three hundred sixty-eight thousand and change. Do you know what that number is? Three sixty-eight, two fifty-seven, eighty. Thank you. What's a premium mean? Basically, it meant that uh, the market was willing to spend more to buy our bonds. Um, the bonds were attractive. The interest rates were good. Um, timing was right. There wasn't a lot going on in the market. So they paid a premium to have our bonds. So what does that mean for us? That means that we received an additional, instead of, in, in addition to selling the bonds at a certain interest rate, we received additional money on top of that in the amount of $368,000. Um, and that bond premium is now available to us, um, and we can do a number of different things with that. We can... Um, return it to uh, the public um, rather than uh, and just over a 20-year term on the recap sheet. Um, we can use those funds as additional revenue uh, for a project of similar length of borrowing as the original borrowing intent of the police station. So a project uh, with 20-year lifespan, um, we can apply these bond proceeds to that specific project and ultimately still pay it back over a 20-year period um, of approximately $18,000 a year goes back in the recap process to the residents that funded it originally. So there's really no loss on behalf of the, the residents that supported, or all town residents, uh, on, the, on the tax rate. Uh, what we would like to do is use the bond premium uh, for the police station. Uh, our plan is to uh, build a maintenance bay at the police station, which is part of the original design that was approved by uh, town meeting. Uh, unfortunately, the bids came in over estimate, uh, and we need to, to figure out how to cut some, some, of, the, some of those costs. Uh, the maintenance bay was one of those cuts. Uh, but the maintenance bay, uh, according to the, the police department, is a very important operation to this, this police station. Um, it allow us to bring in seized vehicles, do inspections in, in a climate-controlled environment, um, and additional storage, and as well as actual maintenance on vehicles. Um, so we we're asking to use that premium for the police station, uh, and then any additional all the uh, the the three hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars will we repay to the residents over a twenty-year term through the tax recap process. How much does this maintenance bay cost? Well, the estimate, uh, was it goes back to the original project design, uh, is approximately $275,000. So the idea is, and, and you know, 
because we didn't accept that alternative, that was one of the ad alternates in the original project, um, what we are doing is uh, creating a change order through the general contractor that we hired, Nelco. So we approach them and say, we want to go with the maintenance bay. Uh, we have the, the past price that was the original design, um, but I don't know what the, the, the increase in cost will be because it's a change order. We didn't accept that, that ad alternate. We declined that. But now due to this premium, we feel like we have the ability to move ahead with that, but that's a change order in the project, and we have to have you know, Nelco respond to, to that request. I was hearing you. Did I answer your question? Or <laughs> Who's you're staring at us? Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, that, you know, right now we're not sure. Um, the original project design was about 275000 for that maintenance bay, but it also had additional um, cost within that maintenance bay that I think we are going to wipe out. Um, some additional offices, uh, maintenance officer, uh, a maintenance office for somebody. Um, we don't have a, a somebody that does maintenance uh, in the police department. It'd be nice to have future, you know, if we, we require that in future years, it'd be nice to have that available. But that could be built out over time. That doesn't have to be built as the original, uh, as part of the original project. So I believe there were three ad alternates. And we got down to getting ready to go out to bid. You know, we had an $8.7 mil $8 million approval. That was, a, that was an estimate by our professionals. And then we said, well, just in case, why don't we carve out a couple ad alternates just in case the bids come in higher? And they did. Um, one of the other ad alternates is um, solar panels. Uh, so that's on not a carport, right? Uh, so that's not in the project. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. You know, if the maintenance bay doesn't eat up the total 368, there are still some things that we cut out in the original project that we took to town meeting that maybe we could look at some of the other ones too. Police department, but it seems a little bit um, non. Like, I, I can't imagine it being a, an essential element of, of the police department to have this inspection area for for vehicles. Yeah. And, and you know, contrary to your belief, it's actually pretty useful to us. Uh, on a number of occasions, we seize uh, automobiles, and we bring them into the garage for whatever purpose, uh, obtaining a search warrant. And uh, you know legal obligations that we have to keep it secure. Uh, also, you know anticipation of conducting searches. Um, you know general just cleaning the cars, things like that. Uh, it it's certainly useful. I, I, if you look at our current facility, I mean you could probably argue that we have three maintenance bays there. There's three garages there. Um, we use all of them, uh, so it is useful. Uh, we. It, it certainly wouldn't be a trophy that's just looked at. Uh, we would use it probably daily. Okay, thank you. Question? There were some other ad alternates. In addition, there was a, a second sally port. Uh, right. But the chief, you know, in consultation with the designer, uh, actually prioritized which one would be your first priority, the second sally port, the uh, solar panels on the carport, or the maintenance bay. And, and he chose the maintenance bay, as did the design team. So... Those towns do. Uh, they have maintenance bays. Uh, I believe somebody said it's redundant, but you know, whatever. Uh, you know, it's it's called a maintenance bay, but it, it's not like someone would be out there changing the oil in a cruiser. I mean, we, we don't have that. We currently just okay. sub all that okay. out. Okay. Uh, you know, other towns that I know uh, that have recent police facilities that have built it, uh, I think probably all of them have that, uh, and they all serve the same function. Um, you know, just I could speak with in the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, there was crashed automobiles. Nowadays, uh, the automobiles contain black boxes. Uh, in order to do a proper uh, reconstruction of the, the accident, uh, the car has to be maintained in, a, in an enclosed area until such time you can get a search warrant to obtain uh, a authorization from the court to, to look at the black box. 
uh, things like that, things of that nature. Uh, the car would remain there, uh, you know, pretty much under lock and key until such time as we get authorization from the court to, you know, conduct whatever investigative measures we needed to conduct. Um, you know, th there are other things we do uh, investigative-wise uh, quite frequently that uh, this maintenance bay could serve. Um, you know, pretty frequent, uh, we, we're uh, going through dumpsters and things like that. And, you know, you may see us going back and forth to the our own dumpster on occasion. And, you know, we use the garage currently for that. Um, so it's pretty much a useful tool. That, that's, I, I, I hate to give it up, but I mean, we're, we're, we're happy we're getting the facility that we're getting, so. So this uh, maintenance bay is probably a little smaller. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not, I don't think you'd be seeing cruiser work out there, yeah. other than, it's a you know. garage, essentially. Yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, workshop, I think, would be a better <laughs> term for it, but it's not as sexy as that. Workshop, I guess. <laughs> I'm the dumb one. What's a sally port? <laughs> sally port is a, uh, it's a drive-in, drive-out, so it's basically, it's just used primarily for prisoners. Uh, we do not currently have one. Um, it's basically a, a, a hollow hallway with a, with a door on one side and a door on the other. Cruiser pulls in one door, the door shuts behind you. Uh, prisoner processing is right off to the you know, right or left, however it's designed. Uh, the prisoner's dumped off, secured in the, the booking room, the cruiser drives out, and the door shuts. Yeah, right now we don't have a sally port, so we've got a garage that opens up and then you know they can close it. But it's just not a secure area to bring prisoners. Yeah, no, in. I, I just I, 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 the, I, the term was foreign to me. Yeah. So basically, we've gotten three hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars as a premium on the bonds that we asked for the eight point something whatever it was. Eight point seven. That's okay. correct. So we've got this extra money. So the request is is to put it in some sort of a fund to hold it for things for the police station. Is that what we're, what we're saying? Essentially, yes. Yeah, all right, all right. I vote for the solar panels. I don't understand it because we've spent such a tremendous thing doing that in this town and getting awards for being green and changing all of our lights. Yeah. I don't understand why we're not putting, I'd put that before I'd put the maintenance bond. Well, <laughs> ultimately, um, y those are eligible under the Green Communities Grant process, and the plan is to, to apply for that. Not this year, because we already have an application ready to go, but next year we'll do it after the market and, and apply for those at no cost to the town. But So if we put them in now, we can't get the money back? No, it, it, it <laughs> that is not how it works. You, you actually apply for whatever you want, and if you receive that grant, then you can use that on that particular purpose. I, purpose. I withdraw my... <laughs> Build a sally port. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's the is, is there an impact on the, the tax, on the residence tax? When you said you can give it back to the, to the residents over, over No, the it's, it's essentially a wash okay. because the, 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 the residents get paid back every year the, the one twentieth of that amount through the tax recap process in the fall. So there's no effective impact on the tax rate. So the Department of Revenue has a concept they, they call true interest costs. They only allow us on a debt exclusion to charge the residents the true interest fee. So if you get a premium, they say, they're say well, let's, let's say the bond was 4.5%, uh, but we get this premium, the true interest cost might be 4.4%. That's all we're allowed to charge the residents. So this money will go back over a 20 year period to reduce the, the debt exclusion we get we get for that money. And that would be the same thing as if we didn't even spend the money, is that right? Well, essentially what's well, going to happen is it's going to come off our, the amount of taxes we can raise every year, mm -hmm. you know, and essentially a reduction in our taxes that we can raise 18, by $18,000. You know, we've been doing very well on new growth over the past few years. You know, if this company comes in, that'll be an additional. But, you know, that's, so I think, I feel comfortable uh, recommending that. Okay. I got a question for all our fans that are watching. So if we have gr garage bays right now that you're using for this uh, activity, inspection, et cetera, can you continue using what you have here? And if not, why? 
still, if I understand your question, use the current phase. phase. Uh, sure, you could. I mean, just logistically, it'd be a little difficult, you know, if we were to travel. And, you know, frankly, I don't know that we're aware at, at, at this point what function that Reuse phase of that is going to be serving in the next year or two. So, you know, it may very well be that the, the next you know, department yeah. or service that goes over there is going to need that. The plan is right now, and, and we've got a feasibility study as part of the capital plan to, to look into that, but what, what would we've been thinking about is moving the ambulance crew over there, mm -hmm. changing the door to an automatic door opener, and, uh, you know, have areas for their sleeping quarters as well. So it'd be a much quicker response from the ambulance to wake up, go out the door into an ambulance, and open the door and get leave versus going across, coming through the library, going through the fire station, you know, starting up an ambulance. So that's just one idea. There's other I thoughts I for that just space. just want to ask. Yeah. Yeah. People, you know, one of those three bays is actually an evidence closet uh, that was built out by the staff. And, uh, but, you know, you really have two small, tight bays. Um, and there's n to me, there's not enough uh, room to do anything in there. But that's just my opinion. Thanks. So, sorry, I have, uh, so I guess in terms of question, you got a maintenance bay that is about two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. So I'm just wondering what happens to the ninety-three thousand dollars. That it does it have to be for just the police station itself rather than for the general fund? Well, first, the, the two seventy-five was was the original project estimate. Yeah. Project estimate yeah. that would have been in the original bid. Now, if it's under change, that two seventy five could become three ninety three hundred. We don't know, mm -hmm. but we know it's not going to be two seventy five. Mm -hmm. Now it's not part of the the, the seventy million bid back. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you know. I'm not so assuming, but still, yeah. If it's less than that, then we end up using that as a, a offset to the decrease in the the debt exclusion, so that it walks. You know, it's a little bit not so much to give it a. You know the revenue source but also the decrease in the tax revenue source you know ultimately our plan is to to fund a maintenance bay um, and then use the rest of the money as contingency uh, just in case um, we had to pare back this project quite a bit because of the uh, the bids came in over estimate so you know there are a number of things that we've cut back on uh, we've done some value engineering of this project going forward so we've got some additional costs savings uh, as a result uh, but it's always good to go on a project with, you know, four to five percent contingency. Right now, we have probably close to three percent. So I'd feel more comfortable with a higher contingency uh, for the what-if moments. Now it seems like we're getting out of the ground, uh, close to being out of the ground now, with limited impact on that contingency. You know, we've had some unsuitable soils, not contaminated soils, just unsuitable for a foundation. So a lot of those soils would be able to be used on the site for non-foundation bearing uses, uh, landscaping and other types of uses that most of those soils will be used on site. Uh, so. Would you still have to bring in new fill to, to replace, replace what you couldn't use to make the foundation? So the cost is going to bring in all the new fill that so the idea is to, to beef up the contingency to get through this project, and at the end of the project, then we can decide, you know, what we're going to do with that extra money if there is any extra money left over. Jim, are you satisfied with the bid that we got before to what we approved at the town meeting to what's actually coming? Is it staying within a framework of your past experiences, or yeah, or or, or, or did somebody do not, not did whoever did our bidding did they? My question is, did you do a, a good job? <laughs> um, I think they did. You know, in, in fairness, I think the, the, the really the, the general contractor came in right about where we thought it would come in. The issue was the filed sub-bids that came in over. Um, we, we asked for, through the bid plans, a, a highly specialized HVAC system. Uh, the same system that we have in all other municipal facilities. Um, and that uh, was just very expensive. And it came in way over, uh, I think it was $300,000 in that amount of money that it came in over bid. Um, and we've done some value engineering since then and lowered that cost. Uh, but there were other, 
I think HVAC, uh, miscellaneous metals, roofing, that came in over bid. And we did uh, value engineer that down. We did go out to bid again for HVAC. I think one other filed sub bid. I can't recall off the top of my head. So, so the filed sub bids, a couple of them came in over estimate. The general contractor came in right about where we expected it to come in. But if you've got the filed sub bids, uh, $500,000, $600,000 over bid, and then you have a general contractor come in at bid cost, and you still have that that five hundred six thousand dollars over your estimates, um, and through the value engineering, we got that number down to probably two hundred three hundred thousand um, dollars. But there's still, you know, we had to cut back on the, the contingency, um, you know, because we had a more comfortable contingency before going into this uh, the bid process. Um, but that's where we had to pare it down. Hopefully, with this bond premium being approved, then, then we can build that up a little bit and, and feel more comfortable about it. Sounds good. Great. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Okay. Might as well stick around for the next one. Yeah, okay. yeah might as well. Yeah, Article yeah. three. Still on the police department <laughs> subject. Um, you know, w we thought. You know, we have the opportunity to present this now because we're in the middle of building a police station. And, you know, the bond premium obviously is directly related to the police station. And hopefully after, you know, February town meeting, February 12th, on the 13th, we can let the contractor know and let our OPM know that, okay, ask for the change order. Let's move forward with this. And, and so rather than waiting to May, which was our original plan, we now have the opportunity to move it forward quicker, uh, which is good because the foundation is about to go in, and it's nice to know that we can move forward with that. The next one is related to the communications. Um, from the start, we had – that was one of the uh, thoughts that we had uh, with, the, with the overbid prices coming uh, – with the prices coming in overbid. Um, we moved – um, what at that time was fiber outside and planned to use capital funds uh, to purchase the fiber. Um, we've been working with a consultant, uh, John Connolly of Cybercom? Cybercom. Cybercom is the company. Um, to fully design a uh, public safety network that solves longstanding issues of communications within the town of Sutton. Um, this was an issue 10 years ago when I arrived in town, and it had brought, been brought up five years prior, and uh, it, for some reason it didn't move forward. Um, and so we, we are left with a communication system that is lacking. Uh, there are a number of dead zones in the town, and that's, uh, that's an issue of safety, uh, particularly for public safety, for police and fire and EMS. Um, so. We asked John Connolly to design a system that will work for us for the coming future. Um, he is recommending a fiber line coming from the tower outside of Town Hall uh, down to the new police station and extending further down to um, Manchog Water Tower. All fiber all along that area. That will increase the receptivity. In addition, you're going to have antennas that are called simulcast antennas, which I don't understand the technology, but apparently these antennas rotate and find the best uh, signal um, and direct that signal in a certain direction versus a single antenna that doesn't have um, the ability to send that signal somewhere else. Um, further, we're going to replace the current tower at Wilkes, adjacent to Wilkes Water Tower. There's a 75-foot tower adjacent to that water uh, I guess, uh, tower or water tank. tank. And um, what we plan to replace that with is a 100-foot monopole versus the 75-foot. So we're going to increase the height of that to get above the tree line so there's better reception. And we're going to lay fiber from Town Hall over to uh, Wilkes uh, water tank. Um, and then, you know, take that existing 75-foot tower and potentially relocate that down in South Sutton, which is one of the uh, dead areas, if you will. We're, we're trying to figure out the right site for that, potentially down in the Huff Road sewer department area. Um, 
so all of those costs contained, um, that number went up. Right now, the estimate is $600,000. Um, we are planning to apply for some additional uh, revenue to deal with this issue, um, but we do are looking for the full $600,000 to be able to move forward with that. We are in the process of applying for a community compact grant through the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the town of Newburyport recently received a $100,000 grant from the community comp compact program to install fiber communications throughout their town. Uh, we're looking for a very similar application. Uh, we're in the process of preparing that application currently. We're also looking to use the 911 grant that we receive on an annual basis to go towards additional infrastructure for communications. So um, that if that happens and we are uh, we get those uh, funding sources, that'll lower the amount of money that we are looking to to borrow after the fact. Um, so uh, the the request is to for the article is essentially to uh, fund the communications um, layout uh, and uh, the cost of that is approximately six hundred thousand dollars. That'll be in the warrant uh, the motion. No. Public safety. Public safety, yeah. Um, it's not cellular communications. Radio. Two way radio. Two way radio or what's the other one too? It's police, fire, high ambulance and high rapid. And they've fully done them too with the big box of quarters that they put down in the street for you and you? Uh, as far as like power backups, things like that. Power backups, you're talking, you know, fiber network. So yes. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing one line that is going across from here to Mantown. Right. Um, so if, if something happens with that line, if, if three lines have breach, right. breach ha have issues, what, what's the redundancy that, issue? That, that's one of the issues that we face now because currently uh, we use telephone line. Uh, and I wouldn't deem it as urgent, but we've been using telephone line uh, between these sites for probably 20 years. And uh, recently it's been brought to our attention that Verizon is no longer servicing those lines. So when there's a problem with the line, they're basically going to tell public safety, uh, you know, agency, sorry, uh, you know, but the line's down and we're not repairing them anymore. So that, that was another issue. And, and, you know, to answer your question, yes, we have had occasions where those phone lines have, have been compromised either from a storm or someone hit a pole or just, you know, they were old copper lines and they, they become problematic. So the thought with the fiber is uh, short of someone taking out a pole and wiping out the line, uh, it, it wouldn't be as problematic. Uh, the fiber company also offers a uh, yearly auction where they guarantee, you know, so many hour response time for repairs and things like that in the event that that does does happen. But yes, uh, redundancy not to a hundred percent will be factored into this communication system, but to an extent that we'd still be able to operate and probably operate better than where we're at currently. And the funding, Jim, is. I'm sorry. The funding for it. Well, right now the plan is to use uh, free cash because that's what's available to us. Um, you know, we have approximately $1.6 million in free cash. Uh, the capital plan is approximately $700,000. Uh, the the, the uh, fiber network and, and all the uh, appurtenances to it is uh, close to $600,000. Our plan is to use, once, once the new fiscal year is, is established in July 1, then we can swap out uh, some of the free cash with new growth, which is an available source. Um, that may be done at a fall town meeting. Uh, and we did that last year. We swapped out uh, a free cash for new, new growth. We inserted new growth and took out the free cash, and that increased our free cash allotment. So right now, our free cash, after the capital plan, and the fiber network is, you know, 1.3. You take away 400,000 from new growth, which we plan on appropriating at the at the latest fall town meeting. 
Uh, so we're still carrying forward a significant amount of free cash. Other questions? And Article Four, you know, w I'm sorry. sorry. One other no. thing I failed to, to to discuss, and we didn't, we don't have time to go through all the coverage networks. But the police station building committee, chaired by Wendy Mead, has been doing a lot of work on with John Connolly uh, and Cybercom about the whole coverage network. Um, you see our current coverage, and then you see after the system is installed, and a lot of that's conservative, so it's really hard to estimate. Um, but a significant increase in the coverage of the entire town, which is a, is a benefit for all of our, mm -hmm. our residents and everybody else. So just wanted to mention that. Uh, if all goes well, when do, we when, when do we hope to take occupancy of the new police station? Assuming uh, no more problems. Sure. Um, probably January or February of next year. Okay, so. So it's essentially a year time frame for construction. So w would this new fiber uh, optics uh, communication, would that be up and running simultaneously? It'll be done uh, before then, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, article, I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying, I mean, it, it, does it cost a lot to hook it into our current station? Yeah. And then you have to move it to another station a couple of months later? We, we wouldn't. to our new facility, and okay. then from the new facility down to the man-charged uh, water tank on Reservoir Ave. Okay, so there, so we're not s spending money just for a short period of no, time? No, okay. not, no money whatsoever uh, used for this police facility. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, I appreciate it. Ar article number four is to, uh, to see if the town will uh, essentially purchase actuators and motors for the wastewater treatment facility. Um, these funds are out of retained earnings within the sewer department, so there's really no cost impact to the town and the general fund. Um, it's just that the, the deep freeze that we had in January, a number of the motors seized up down there. Um, and I asked, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, department head of the wastewater treatment facility, what would be his plan if we didn't have a special town meeting? And, you know, he would continue to spend money and run the accounts in deficit and hopefully at May town meeting reestablish those accounts w using the retained earnings. So we have the opportunity to address this now. Um, the, the motors are 14, 15 years old. Um, they don't have those replacement motors any anymore. You've got to actually buy new motors. Um, I actually don't know the details of those motors and actuators. I didn't even know that term before at this town meeting. But, um, you know, according to Don, it's approximately $46,000, and all of that will become out of uh, retained earnings in the sewer department. Does Prime Metals make actuators and motors? <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you. Yeah. <laughs> Do they want to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and that's all I have for okay. a warrant. Great. We like locally sourced. <laughs> you're saying. Any questions on Article 4 from anybody? Okay. So it is um, what are they? What are 743, 4. Uh, so we'll close the public hearing uh, unless anyone has any. Um, I think we probably need a motion to close that. Um, motion to close the hearing, public hearing. Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. So we are unanimous on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what we'll do, um, Jim, are you? prepared to talk about the capital plan or is this just for us tonight i, I think what I after the uh, after the the uh you know public hearing i think right that's so we will we, we so the public hearing portion of the meeting has been closed i i thought what we do is we could talk about and, and get our votes on those articles and then if you're you're willing to, to spend some time just to I will talk about the capital plan right after that yeah no problem that'd be great okay Okay, so um, as usual, what we, what we normally try and do with this um, is we will uh, have a motion uh, and hopefully a, a second. 
um, discuss any issues uh, with each of the articles. We'll have a vote uh, what, what our recommendation should be, and um, we'll go from there. So um, Article 1 uh, is to uh, approve the, uh, the TIF uh, with prime metals. Make a motion to approve Article 1 as written. Any discussion on uh, Article 1, uh, people's thoughts? Yeah, one thing that I don't have information on is the what's our alternative? What other manufacturing facilities may be interested in the area? Are there any? Is this our only chance to secure what appears to be a, a good manufacturer for the area? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that we should feel desperate about it, but I think it's a, to me, it's a good, it's a it's a great use of the of the uh, of the property, um, and the, the TIF makes an awful lot of sense economically to the town in terms of what tax revenues are now. Um, yeah, I would say in the short term we're not losing, um, but in the long term we're gaining, and we're also gaining future um, potential based on the expanding amount of you know negotiations with companies of this size and inspectors I mean internationally it's not a bad thing to do especially in little town like Tiffin. Yeah. yeah I look at it because I go back to uh, when it was um, you know Home Depot or you know BJ's whoever it was that ended up down the road you know who we wanted to we wanted to put in there and uh, what are we now 15 16 years later uh, before we get somebody uh, of uh, you know there and so uh, we lost a lot of money thinking that when you when you asked that it was an old saying that my mother used to say it was a dirty game and I think it'd be good and I happen to live right over there too so I I, I think um, it's I, I think it's a good use of that land yeah. you know I, I look at it, you've got a long-standing employer with with, with a major name with a skilled workforce who more than likely may choose to move into our town help our tax base help our spillover I just think it's a trip a winner all over the place and um, I think it'd be foolish not to support something that is a small one okay, okay so uh, all those in favor if there's some, no more questions we'll have uh, a vote all those in favor of recommending uh, rec recommending article one uh, for passage at town meeting Aye. 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 Uh, any opposed no so we're unanimous in that Thank you for coming in. It was great. Jeez. Remember, I've got a shovel for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on, I'm on the <laughs> you said you're a neighbor, right? I am. In case they forget there's that day. I'll bring my tractor over. I got a I got a bucket <laughs> on the front. <laughs> <laughs> um, article two, uh, which is um, to see if we would approve the uh, appropriation of the bond premium of approximately $368,000 from the sale of the bonds uh, for the police station project. I guess in general, and it's not specific as to that maintenance pay, and it probably won't be at the, the, the at town meeting, it, it won't be referred to as a construction of a, the maintenance bay. It will just be applied to the, the project. project itself, and then you can, right, okay. That's See, our Otherwise, you'd have to, would have to go to another town meeting to appropriate it again to use for something else. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we'll uh, take make a motion to approve Article Two as written. Uh, discussion on Article Two. You clarified my my question so that if the bid came in, you know, extremely high and it wore into kind of that contingency you were looking at, you probably wouldn't do that and just put this all into contingency and work off that. I mean, absolutely. I think we give the flexibility to the police station project and, yeah. and have it continue. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Um, all those in favor then of recommending Article 2 for passage? Aye. 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 Uh, any opposition? No. Article 2, we recommend passage 7-0. Uh, Article 3 is to see if the town will uh, vote to fund um, 
the fiber optic uh, communication installation, the fiber optic communication equipment system. So whatever that reads. Um, <laughs> motion. motion to approve Go. Article Three as written. Second. And discussion on Article Three. Seems to make sense. I'm, uh, I'm surprised we We've are operating with yeah. without it. Yeah. I know we've gone a long time without it, yeah, and I know it's been talked about. Um, it makes sense. I'm just I'm worried about a lack of redundancy. I think in that in light of the fact that Verizon is <laughs> no longer maintaining their own telephone network, um, but um, that's just my days of telecom. No, no, I agree. I mean, just this last big storm we had, you know, a uh, tree came down across my street and knocked out all the wires, and uh, the town was very quick to remove the trees, you know, that across the road, but, uh, you know, we, we were uh, without stuff for three or four days, and, you know, I mean, you can live in a, in a house that way if you got a generator, but I'd feel really bad not, not being able to have the police come over and visit if I needed them. It sounds like it's the same risk we live with right now with Verizon, though, doesn't it? It, it, it does, but I'm thinking if, it, and it's just me, but I've got an expense of hundred thousand dollars. I'd like to actually have uh, a little bit of a backup as opposed to the same amount of risk that I have now. So it worries me that I have a cell phone in my bag and say people that don't have an iPhone phone they can't call and say who's home. That's what that's what worries me. If there's an accident down on Tenth or Turnpike, that if nobody can, there's no cell phone company, so you can't even get to the police fire. Or so much I think that's so a whole, that's a separate <coughs> issue being addressed yeah. with no, the cell I phone know, coverage. It's a safety yeah. issue that needs to be addressed too. But hopefully, if the car fire doesn't occur, it's addressed. It's an interesting concern, but for our public safety folks throughout the town, it's just they, they need that communication. It's it's essential. Anything else may be debatable with the police station building, but not public not communication. Yeah. In, I mean, I agree with you about the redundancy aspect, uh, but I don't know enough about the technology to really know even what that means uh, outside of yeah. yes I do but I don't know what the, what the, all the technology yeah, is involved in so. I, I, I managed in a facility that had basically you know we always referred to it as the single pipe and when that pipe got cut you lost everything and so with it without having redundancy with with the fiber network for the police station for the you know for the town here you know that leaves us in the same boat, which feels a bit precarious to me. But there, there, there is, to answer your question, there is, there is an option for redundancy. Uh, you know, obviously it costs money. It's, I mean, I think uh, the way it was explained to us from the fiber optic contractor was to create a loop. Mm -hmm. So if there is a break, the fiber connection just goes around the break either way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to say it was about another hundred and just off the top of my head, another hundred and something thousand dollars, which would you know bring additional benefits because you could, you know, serve other areas of town with that fiber network, mm -hmm. um, which you know could probably be a benefit to the community and the town. So, you know, to answer your question, there is a plan for redundancy, but like everything else, it, co it costs money. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. But is it worth asking the question, yeah. Jim? I mean, you know, there's there's no dollar amount on here. They were all approximate. So is it worth at least asking the question? I'll vote yes for this, but yeah. I mean, but, but I mean, are we are, we are we better off to look for, you know, something to, to help the police chief? So this is a long-term plan, and, and right. we just had a meeting maybe a week or 10 days ago with Paul Maynard and another company that designs these fiber systems and creates the whole redundancy. I think um, that's a potential future addition to this system. Um, we just don't have enough information at the time as to what we need to design. And, and giving us extra money right now, I, I don't think it's needed, but if, it, if we have a plan by you know, April or, or you know, May, then we would come to May town meeting and, and possibly ask for additional funds for extending that fiber system that creates Article 4 uh, is the actuator purchase of the motor. 
lige sige tidligt. Jeg skal ikke være der til at prøve det igen. Okay. Uh, discussion on Article 4. Well, the one question that I failed to ask when we were going through Article 4 is really the, you know, what is the life span of actuators and motors in those flow treatment plants that, you know, 15 years, is that, um, is that normal to, should we be appropriately maintenance on this? What, what is our lifespan for actuators? I don't get anywhere to go with this question. Um, <laughs> and what keeps them from freezing again so that we don't end up, you know. Good question. <laughs> Young, younger actuators don't freeze. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> they probably freeze faster. Yeah, uh, I, 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 unfortunately, I can't speak to it. Uh, the school director is still around, so I'm not sure the answer to that one. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, we we need to yeah. obviously yeah. fund this, but but I think we need to think about this in in terms of certain amounts. The school that department we're voted on this representative. So But new, but obviously a, a new motor or actuator, um, there'd be replacement parts available for that as opposed to for what we have now? For new uh, equipment, there would be. Uh, okay. you know, the problem is the old equipment is no longer uh, manufacturing and replacing itself for the new equipment. Okay. Okay. And do we have sort of a long-term warranty, <laughs> extended warranty with the new equipment so that we're not purchasing replacement parts? That's another good question. Sorry, I've I can get you the answer to that, but I do not know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. It's kind of saying like a water heater or like uh, that kind of. You know, I'm just saying that my heater. old dishwasher lasted for 20 years, my new one for five, and so I'm not <laughs> feeling good about any replacement of equipment right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all those in favor of recommending passage of Article 4? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And so we will recommend Article 4 for passage 7-0. Um, okay. Can we talk about capital plan? You want it? Good night. Does everybody have a copy of the you capital you plan for us? Yes, we do. Um, so I presented this before the Board of Selectmen uh, a few weeks ago, but I, you know, this is a one opportunity I have to present it to you folks. Um, again, we're in the enviable position to be able to use free cash for our capital plan. Um, our capital stabilization fund uh, this July will grow to over $700,000. Uh, the following year it will be over a million dollars. So. You know, we are looking that the long-term capital plan, we are planning on replacing a piece of apparatus for the fire department. Uh, I think engine three down in Wilkes. Um, we, we will be able to fund that uh, one year through a cash purchase through the capital stabilization fund. So that's the benefit of using free cash. We really are able to protect the capital stabilization fund. So then we're able to pay cash for large items uh, that you never would have thought we'd be able to do in the past. So, um, so anyway, um, and this this is a result of we we received I think 1.4 million dollars in requests for capital items, and I pared that down to just under 700 thousand um, dollars. Let me go through that. The uh, elementary school boiler replacement this past fall, we replaced a boiler in the early learning center. Um, we funded $100,000 in the capital plan last year, but we happened to receive a green community grant for $150,000, completely paid for that boiler replacement. So that's, that's $100,000 that isn't spent and will return back to the capital stabilization fund. Um, the, this is, I funded $40,000. We're going to apply again to the Green Communities Grant for a boiler replacement in the elementary school. Um, and if we don't get it, we have $40,000 and $100,000 from last year, so we have enough to replace the boiler in case the, the Green Communities Grant uh, uh, program doesn't fund it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it's sort of an insurance uh, mechanism because the boiler is at the end of life and it needs to be replaced. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that over the summer and the early fall period. Uh, repair elementary school rear egress. Um, John Kucher has been meeting with Roger Raymond over at the school department. Um, the bricks in the back of that school are, uh, and the, the walkway um, off of the back is starting to fall apart. The bricks are crumbling. Uh, the handles, uh, it's really in disrepair and it needs to, we need to invest a little bit of money to prevent a total loss of that uh, landing and ultimately a cost of probably close to $100,000 to replace the whole system. So we think we'll be able to do uh, a, a decent repair job of the existing system for this amount of money. Uh, but right now it's just an estimate, it's not a bid cost. Um, at the schools, we also um, want to add some additional monies to repair the sidewalk. Um, we did receive $30,000 last year in the capital plan. We didn't spend that um, because the cost to repair that sidewalk and provide um, uh, uh, accessibility, a proper accessibility and to ADA regulations required additional money. We had it designed by Andrews Engineering. According to them, the cost is, is much larger than the $30,000, and we got to it late in the year. So by the time the work was done, the kids would be back in school, and it was just too late in the year. So we decided to hold off. Uh, our plan is to go out to bid this spring um, and uh, do the comprehensive uh, handicap accessibility to that sidewalk and to the both buildings, the Early Learning Center and the elementary school uh, so, facility. So this is an additional 30 it is an additional 30, yeah, right, because the original 30 we decided wasn't enough to do the job. We decided to hold off and come back and ask for an, an additional appropriation. And you don't have to, because we didn't spend it last year, you don't have to reappropriate. That's correct. It's, it's there and available for this particular use. Um, library, um, the access uh, and entrance to the library is a little difficult these days. It's the, the sidewalk is somewhat broken up. Mm -hmm. Uh, the accessibility off the, the parking lot, it, it almost meets ADA re regulations, but not by design. It happens that the, the parking lot has sunk or the sidewalk has sunk, so it's almost level, but really it should be a, 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 a professionally designed and, and implemented uh, accessibility uh, sidewalk. Um, the access from the street to the library is difficult. There is a little bit of a uh, curb cut that you have to get over and then uh, you know, slide down to the library, not at the grades required by ADA regulations. So um, I decided to put some money in there uh, for, for that, as well as a handicap accessible door that you press the button and the door opens for you. Uh, and we planned on putting a, a bit of a roof sort of extension. Portico. Portico? Canopy. Canopy? Canopy? Those are great terms. Uh, no, all three of them. Uh, awning. Sally Port. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that might not be necessary at all. So we will put, uh, you know, a canopy or awning over the entrance to prevent what happens is the water comes right off the roof and it comes straight down and it hits the pavement and it bounces it against the door. The door is a steel door. It rots out. Um, and you, if you go down there today, I don't think we've replaced that door. It's rotted out. Um, so that canopy will help alleviate that problem in the future. Um, the schools have asked for uh, uh, smart boards in the remaining um, classrooms that currently don't have them. These are predominantly early learning center and elementary school. The middle school, high school smart boards have already been implemented as part of the construction of the new middle school, high school. Uh, this is a lease purchase, uh, $80,000 a year over three years, um, and this uh, purchases, uh, I don't know the exact number, but uh, according to the school department, this is enough to adequately uh, supply smart boards to all available classrooms um, so the teachers have modern technology uh, to, uh, to apply. So this is 80000 over three years, not 80000 a year. Right. That's right. It, it, it's a three-year purchase. Oh, no. It's, right, so it's 80,000 a year. It's 80,000 for three years. Right, right. So 
or two hundred forty thousand or eighty thousand. It's two hundred forty thousand, eighty thousand a year. And then it's installation, not replacement. That's replacement of smart pools. That's right, it's installation. Yes. No, no, no. It, it, no, it, no that's my question was okay. What are we doing with the old ones? Are we, it's, okay, it's, it's good questions. That's just um, my no, no. stupid error. But thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> I yeah, listen. I, I'm I'm not an educator, um, so. I am, and I use a chalkboard, and I love it. <laughs> you buy so a lot of chalkboard. I mean, don't you? you know, in I know the eighth grade science class, the teacher with the smart board, the kids have the the clickers to be able to answer the question online, and then the results show up in the classroom. So I, I know that uh, several of the teachers are fully utilizing the smart board technology. Yeah, the technology is actually, it is, it is very interactive for the kids. Right. They, they really can get an answer in the, through the classroom piece. And so it's, it's, it's a, actually, for me, teaching, I think it's probably a more three-dimensional classroom. I mean, those are good questions for the well, superintendent. Well, okay. he, he feels very strongly about them, but again, I'm... You know, it's been years since I'm going to bypass our uh, school buses next, you know. Yeah, they're actually making, uh, you know, yeah, well, the, you know, smart vans anyway. Um, wow, so anyway, the next item is the highway uh, is looking for a heater boiler. Right now they have an old um, uh, a heater essentially that utilizes um, oil. Uh, recycled oil that we used to collect at the transfer station and we would heat uh, use that heating oil or use that oil for the heat down at the highway facility uh, we no longer collect oil down at the transfer station um, which is um, a whole nother matter but essentially in the the heater slash boiler is is old and antiquated and it needs to be replaced um, not a significant cost but it is something that's needed uh, for the school, two membranes. This is for the wastewater treatment facility down there. Last year, I think we replaced uh, three uh, membranes, um, but this helps run that uh, treatment facility. Jim, where are we on that study that we got WPI to help us with to get sewers up the, up the road here at that? We have a meeting this Friday with WPI. Um, the, it, it took a while to get going. Um, we've got a graduate student and the professor coming in this Friday to meet with me and Don Obahowski. I think Ryan Fatman's actually going to be there as well um, because he's interested in, in figuring out, you know, if there's any state funds available. So the project will take place in the next, uh, I don't know, three or four months until the end of the, the session, uh, semester, if you will. Uh, and then they will have a report um, that eventually will be presented to the Board of Selectmen uh, professionally as a, as a project. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, we feel like the next step is to hire an engineer to review those plans and place a stamp on them. Um, and, and then we are ready to, to go out to bid if uh, we all, the community and everybody else feels that this is a priority to bring sewer up to the center of town and eventually down to the school department. This feasibility study with WPI brings uh, studies from to the center as well as down to the school, and I think it goes as far as Shaw. I think that was a suggestion at, at town meeting, and uh, it does go as, as far as Shaw. So stay tuned on that one. Uh, Goddard Lodge Rehab, uh, we went out to bid a couple of times on that. Um, w the last time we went out to bid, um, the bid prices came in very close to what we had uh, uh, available as far as grant funds. We have a private donation of $150,000. Uh, we have uh, state money of $100,000, and we have a grant from the federal government um, in the amount of $150,000. So. The, the bid cost came in just slightly below the, uh, the amount uh, that we had available. Um, so that left no contingency. So we didn't feel comfortable moving ahead with this project with no contingency available. So the idea is to appropriate some monies at, at a Maytown meeting and, and then go out to bid again. I plan on going out to bid in March, uh, and hopefully we'll have 
bid prices to go forward to town meeting. And maybe we don't need seventy-five right thousand dollars, but that's just a placeholder. Um, potentially, we'll need that. Um, but you never know what what the bidding market will be. Timing is also important. You know, it's the beginning of the season, March, April, May. Um, if they can move forward right away and early in the season versus late in the season, which we, we've done in the past, and it hasn't worked out because people have already planned for their projects year round uh, for, for the fall. But early in the season, they, their projects haven't uh, been accumulated and planned for. So hopefully. I hate to keep asking this. Where's, where's the Goddard Lodge? It's down at Marion's Camp. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's uh, okay, a couple of corrections here. I gotta just note. I sent the pictures to Leslie Jean Gordon. No, no, uh, Marion's camp. I know where that is. I've never heard Goddard. Um. Uh, technology school department. That is. Um, they, that, this is a, an E-rate matching grant that, that's $150,000. The federal government's going to contribute $75,000. The town is matching that with $75,000. This will do a wireless upgrade throughout the campus from you know, element, early learning center through the high school. Uh, apparently, they use this wireless system uh, for computers and, and devices that individuals bring in and people can connect to. Um, but uh, this was one of their preferred uh, or priority projects and um, will that include the, the cell phone coverage within the schools because there's <sighs> nothing there right now yeah you know I, I you know I, I think the cell tower on town farm road will um, that tower is obviously up we obviously now we need to get power to it and we're working with Kevin Shaughnessy National Grid and Verizon and John Arthur from Wireless Edge to do that so we, we're in con we I talked to John you know a few days ago to discuss that but um, I don't know that whether that will help with uh, cellular communication, but that's a good question for the superintendent and Dan Durgan. That so it won't help with cellular collection, but if they're hooked up to the wireless network and they Voice. establish yeah. they Voice. establish their phone to have that, then inside of that being logged on, yes, you'll have your phone will ring, right? But it will not be through the cellular towers; it'll be through the wireless. wireless. So somebody driving by is not going to get improved cellular coverage. Mm -hmm. It's just anybody um, inside yeah, of the building. I was thinking more of the kids yeah. and the teachers yeah, inside good. of the building. Inside to the be building. Able to, yeah. to mm -hmm. And that's make what those they'll calls. have. Yeah, as long as they have the click button on their, you know, settings on their phone. Not your phone. Yeah, yeah not a flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, it's yeah. yeah, they will totally. And it doesn't sound like so and I'm not sure it sounds like also it's good quality, but it's not going to affect range outside of school buildings. Yes. Which right. still will be the Issue. Yeah, I can't. Speak yeah, you know, we, we're we're well on top of the cell tower issue. I mean, yeah. I, I know one of you know uh, Liz mentioned the cell towers. We are aggressively pursuing the Town Farm Road site. We also are aggressively pursuing a tower at Blackstone National Golf Course. Um, the zoning board is in hearings right now over that tower. Um, I, my assumption is they will approve that tower eventually. Um, and that adds two additional cell towers in that vicinity. Um, so, you know, we're working aggressively to address the cell tower issue. That's, that's a good point. And the utility board has been very active with the Town Farm Road. Yeah, and, you know, the, the th that will be addressed. Um, you know, at least, at the very least, with the Blackstone Tower, but Town Farm Road Tower will be a, a player as well. Um, the firefight equipment, uh, they are asking for $70,000 for forcible entry tools. I don't actually know what those tools are, but again, those are questions for Matt Belsito during the public hearing. You can ask what forcible entry tools are. Uh, I assume it's some sort of jaws of life, I et cetera, uh, but I don't, I didn't ask for what the breakdown is. He's the fire chief, I just take direction from him. Um, the school department is asking for an oil delivery system um, at the Early Learning Center. Apparently the tank is, is distant from the school and they need a delivery system that brings the oil from the tank to the school itself to run the, the boilers, et cetera. Um, and that system costs $17,000. Yeah, $17,000. Um, that system is out of, uh, out of date. Uh, so it's a replacement, not yeah, a exactly, replacement. Exactly, exactly. 
it's not a new system. Uh, you know, the 15,000 for the feasibility study for the police station, we talked about a little bit about that earlier tonight. Um, Gilmore Drive LED lights, $75,000. Uh, this is a commitment that was made uh, by the previous administration. Um, I uh, inherited it, um, and ultimately we're trying to hold true to our word uh, that the town committed to install street lights on Gilmore Drive. Um, you know, now we're installing LED street lights, uh, and there's, there's really the cost is within the infrastructure. This is a check that will be written to National Grid to uh, upgrade the infrastructure. Um, you know, in all fairness, I don't know that we did enough due diligence prior to accepting uh, the, the, the willingness to install these lights because I don't think the infrastructure was up to code when we agreed to assume, assu assume the, uh, the role of installing the lights. When you say com we committed to it, what does that mean? The previous administrator signed a letter of agreement um, that we would um, install and maintain street lights. Sure. Um, the Gilmore Drive Industrial Park Group organization cut a check to the town for $17,000 back nine years ago uh, to pay for this. Um, but little did we know the condition of the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, only recently we started to get involved in uh, the last couple of years and realized it's a significant cost. Okay. Uh, wood chipper of the highway department, $60,000 that chips wood. Anybody wants to know more? Any questions? Uh, <laughs> uh, solar stop signs, um, the highway, we're going to purchase uh, four solar stop signs at the intersection of uh, – Central Turnpike and Putnam Hill Road, the new police station site. Um, so if you blow through that stop sign, then really you, you, you're just not paying any attention uh, with the police station right there next to you. Uh, but it is a, a high uh, visible site, uh, and these solar stop signs are reflective lights all around. It's really in your face. Um, so we're going to try it. Uh, we, you know, the, the town of Holden has these, and there are other communities around the area that have them. I've seen them. They look pretty effective. Um, so we're going to do this as an experiment and, and figure it out. Is there a way the community can get some grant money for that? Y yeah, we did look at that as an option, and th they don't have that as they wouldn't accept that grant. So, unfortunately. Um, la is demolish uh, Shaw Barn. Um, I don't know that I've addressed this group about that. Uh, we are currently paying a, a, a third-party insurer to insure Shaw Barn. Say that ten times fast. Um, the current insurer that we have, uh, Cabot Risk slash Maya, uh, will not insure it. They do not currently do not insure any vacant buildings. Um, so this is one uh, that is a, is a significant building in town. Um, we have looked at to see if we could sell some of the, the lumber and boards uh, within that barn, but the barn was created in the 19 late 40s and 50s, so that, that the, the barn boards are not historic. There's no real value to that. Um, so this is a you know an estimate right now of uh, cost to take that barn down. Uh, right now we're not we don't have any future use of that barn, at least uh, from what I've heard, anybody. Um, it's, it's a beautiful old barn, but it's falling apart. It's no different than the uh, you know, property right down the street, uh, the Beehive, but um, you know, it's town-owned, it's town property, and it's a liability. Uh, we boarded the whole place up. We needed to do that to get the actual third-party insurer to cover that. Uh, but it's still a liability. And somebody could climb up, get it through there, and fall down that 15, 20-foot hole that used to be uh, an area to feed the, the cows and horses through uh, hay through that area. So I don't know what to do with this property. Um, I've, I've asked a lot of people, and um, at this point we've come to the decision to to knock it down and take it down and, and restart. The fire chief and just have a controlled burn and burn it down. Yeah, DEP won't allow that. Um, th I did ask the fire chief that, and 
he felt like because there's really no opportunity like Rita Shaw's house to do repeated rescues and different scenarios. It's just a large barn, and you don't want firefighters going into that barn. Uh, there's many areas that drop off quickly, um, and it's I don't think it's safe enough to send firefighters in there uh, to do any sort of training episode. And, and the chief agrees with that. So unfortunately, um, I don't think that's that's a possibility. So that's to demolish and kind of level, level it off, make it like, you know. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And. Uh, I'm just thinking there's so many artisans in town that need to get across the property and, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, right across the way is, you know, Acre and, and Polly's Antiques is the, you know, something that we could do with the. Well, listen, if the town wants to continue to spend $3,500, $4,000, depending on how the interest, uh, the uh, insurance costs go up every year to, to provide an artistic you know, opportunity. No, I, I know I I'm not being facetious, but it is, it's a real situation, you know, and I, I'm kind of conflicted because I see those beautiful paintings and, and drawings and pictures from and, uh, April Eaton Brown and, and others, but, you know. Well, maybe they can just demolish it. They can also kind of like fail to kind of get the funds yeah, in. Don't use them to repair the drapery. <laughs> of wood. All right. Before we, before <laughs> we start getting loopy. Well. This is, yeah, this is um, the material in the break room. I just added this. We're in negotiations with the Teamsters. Um, we did replace the roof. Um, ultimately, it leaked into the, the ceiling of the break room, and there is some uh, potential contamination of mold, et cetera. So we're, our plan is to replace the, the drywall and the, the ceiling of that room and make it inadequate you know the, the highway department does a lot for this town particularly this time of year and you know I just want to try to make their you know their living conditions a little bit more habitable okay. and then you know a special items would be the cemetery they're lo looking to replace a lawnmower uh, building materials at this at this transfer station uh, we appropriated some funds uh, retained earnings from the the uh, transfer station in previous years um, that they were able to build out the the ramps that it, that uh, they bring recyclables to, um, so that money was well spun spent. Uh, they are interested in doing a new roof for the uh, the shack, if you will, uh, and windows. It's it's just uh, you know a little bit of money that greatly improves that station. And you know we have retained earnings, which is a nice situation at the transfer station. We haven't always had that. And then the fiber, uh, the um, the fiber fiber simulcast is uh, six hundred thousand dollars, not four hundred. Four hundred was the original figure until we figured that we needed to replace the tower at uh, Wilkes, uh, adjacent to Wilkes Water Tower, and r run fiber down there. So, Jim, when these are funded out of, of free cash, we appropriate that free cash, and then if we don't use it, it goes into the stabilization fund. We're not spending the same. Free no, cash it overall. essentially goes back into free cash. I misspoke earlier. Uh, it, it, when we use the capital stabilization fund, if we don't use that money, it goes back into that fund. If we don't use free cash, it essentially gets recertified the following year, and it falls out as free cash. So that if we don't, for whatever reason, uh, build, uh, install this, the the LED lights this year for seventy five grand. That goes back to free cash, and then we have to go. Th then we have to reappropriate that. That's correct. Um, you know the the boiler replacement. Um, I think we originally funded it through free cash, the hundred thousand um, dollars, and now the additional forty thousand dollars. So on the sidewalk repair that we originally that's going to be sixty thousand, we've done thirty. We've appropriated thirty last year. Why aren't we reappropriating sixty thousand? That's a good question. I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, I can get back to you on that um, and maybe revise this because I think we appropriated free cash last year and didn't expend it, so it fell back as free cash. Um, it was appropriated in May at that town meeting, so it was available July 1. So if the, w if the work is done in this fiscal year, by using free cash, which is an available funding source, yep. 
then we can use it. Uh, if not, then we will need to reappropriate that. So that, that's a good question. I, I'll have to figure that out. Okay. Um, and I, so the last thing I, I think, unless someone has questions about the capital plan, is to talk about maybe the schedule. What, what I would like to uh, meet with the Finance Committee um, shortly after I do the budget presentation, preliminary budget presentation to the Board of Selectmen. I plan on doing that on February 20th or whatever that, that Tuesday night meeting is. February, I think it's February 20th is a Tuesday night. Um, so that's when I'll present to the Board of Selectmen. Um, I typically like to present to the Finance Committee shortly thereafter, either the following night or the following week. Uh, any day is available. That would be an option, yeah. If, that, if you're good with that, I'm good I, with I that. I am. Makes sense. Okay, I don't know if anybody else, other members want to participate. One more day. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be at 6 o'clock? 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. 6.30. Next week is that is that better for you? No, I mean I can I, you know I, I I'm out Tuesday I can stay out Wednesday I mean it doesn't matter I mean you get it done then I have the following week you know so um, you know while it's still fresh I can just do the presentation the following sure. night. You want us to leave the board of selectmen waiting till the day of one? Listen, I I want to respect this committee and want to do what I you You've know I've always done. I've always done uh, a follow-up to the Board of Selectmen. I, I do present, present that option, but, you know, I'd, I'd rather, you know, I'd, I like addressing this committee a and answering your questions specifically rather than the Board of Selectmen's, but yeah. that's just a, a personal preference. Um, respecting your, you know, the time that you have to spend, I mean, it is helpful to hear the perspective of the Board of Selectmen, the questions, and give them, have a little time to kind of digest that before our meeting. But if, you know, um, we, if the Board of Selectmen are amenable to that, uh, we, I'm sure we could work around that, so. Either way. Yeah, I mean, that works for us the 21st, if. Yeah, let's just, let's do that, and, you know, obviously, if I'm, you know, I'll, I'll be fine. Tim can always do the presentation, I think. <laughs> He's not here. He, can't, he can't hear <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Um, so, and then, ultimately, we need to schedule uh, finance committee public hearings. Sure, yeah. Um, I have uh, a schedule that we've had in the past. We typically do, um, th uh, this is uh, actually from 16. We had uh, Wednesday, March 16th, Wednesday, March 23rd, and then Tuesday, March 29th. Um, and the last was the school department and planning articles or articles, uh, warrant articles. Um, so, you know, we typically have the town administrator, town accountant, council on aging, library, assessors, and Blackstone Valley. I think we, it was sort of dependent upon Blackstone Valley's availability. I think we had to move it around last year. Mm -hmm. um, I think we had the school department and Blackstone Valley on the same night. Yeah. Yeah. I can't recall, but. And then, you know, the following uh, Wednesday is police, fire, am ambulance, highway, snow and ice, transfer station, and sewer. Um, the, the big departments, uh, and then the school department and planning articles. The 16th is a Friday. Do we, 
So it would, yeah, so he's, we'll, he's, it would be the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th if we did the Wednesday. The warrant articles are due, I think, um, March 22nd. Is that a Thursday? It's a it's Thursday. Thursday. So I think that's when the warrant articles are due. Um, so any, any time after that would be appropriate to have the, you know, citizens' petitions and other kind of warrant articles okay. other than the budget. I think we're looking at a marijuana uh, zoning bylaw, which which failed, I think, at Fall Town Meeting. Was that at Fall Town Meeting? Yeah, I think it was. So um, it didn't get the two thirds vote. So we're kind of redesigning that and trying to figure out a way for that to get approved. Ultimately, if nothing's approved by October 31st, then the whole town is open to recreational marijuana. So we we certainly don't want that to happen. So the zoning bylaw is is important. Proposing the 14th, the 21st, and the 28th then of March. Is that what we're proposing to do? I can tell you the 14th is going to be. A, I'm going to have a very difficult day placing that. The 14th, work-wise. I um, mean, we, we can always bump it out a week. So go the 21st, 28th, and then April. Well, we could do two. I mean, we used to, we have been doing two and one one week, and then two the following week. Do like 21, 28, 29? Or 21, 27, 28. So the 21st is a Wednesday? Yeah. Uh, it yes. will not be available. Uh, oh, before I that. Thir uh, yeah, that Thursday is better, that week. I just put that out there. It's really the committee's decision on, on when you want to hold these meetings. All right. But uh, you know, the only condition is that the, the finance committee recommendations are due. Uh, uh, you know, hopefully we get them prior to the board signing the final warrant uh, for a Maytown meeting, and that's generally the second meeting in April. Okay. It was tempting to just say, I don't know. Do, do we not vote? I, I, do, do we vote like we can watch the meetings – Afterwards, can we do and vote yes. if it's right. needed? Remember, we, we, we did a. You can miss a meeting. We can miss a meeting. Was that was that something that was permanently put in, or was that just a a, a, a town meeting? Town yeah. meeting. Yeah. To if if somebody missed a. That's right. Meeting. Was that for all meetings, or just for this? I that thought that was for all. Yeah, That's there was no. I don't think all boards and commissions. All boards and commissions. And that was approved by the attorney general, so I, I suppose that that's in effect. Yeah. So you can if needed. Yeah, so if right. needed, you could watch the Board of Selectmen or the Finance Committee. Finance committee and watch the Finance Committee. And be it certified, you know, come in and watch it and then yep. whatever, sign the certification. So, I don't, I don't want to hold up the process being on May the 1st when it's already May. You know, like Is there any particular night that works for you better? No, you know, this time of year I just kind of <laughs> cross off and um, – um, so is it 22, 27, 28? I mean, and then you've got everybody covered. You don't have to watch TV. So the 22nd is a Thursday? Because it would be the 23rd yeah. and yeah. the 28th? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. 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 Second would be the just twenty second. Yeah. Twenty second, twenty eighth. Okay. Yeah. Pat. Where are you gonna be? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm going to Greece in April, so I'll I'll be I'll be here. Okay. I think Bob said he was coming back in March, so he might be available for that date. Did you have Tom? Yeah, I'm uh, those dates are in Sue Sue May. May. No, I'm not going till May. Yeah, what about spring? When's the town meeting? May town meeting? Yeah. The second Monday in May, I think that's the fourteenth? Yes. The second Monday in May. Sue, I don't know what her. I don't know what Sue's in, in the area, but I would assume she will be available for those meetings. Okay. Diane, you can hit I your panel. I have to, I have to double check um, okay. for something. I, 
Let's put on Facebook Live. Okay, let's plan on those. Oh, and, I mean, and you can just watch the video of me doing yeah. it on Facebook Live. Yeah. <laughs> sure. So, so we're two twenty seven, twenty eight. So the twenty twenty two. Twenty second, twenty seventh, and twenty eighth. And are we doing six thirty? So you're gonna yes. Tom and I have a little challenge with reading yeah. the times. Okay. Reading the times. I didn't want to say anything, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't change the lines. We want to read okay. the story. Okay. That's August first. If that works for you, Jim, we'll go with those. Yeah. So we have meetings scheduled on February twenty one for the uh, budget prep presentation the 22nd 27 28th will be the public hearings Oops. and um, do you know when we'll get the the budget books um, after I give them I give them to the Board of Selectmen at their preliminary budget hearing which is February 20th yeah. so they'll be available that night uh, to be picked up okay um, you know, I like to present the budget to the board first, yep. uh, but then it's the, the budget documents are available okay. that night. Okay. Or I can just deliver them to the meeting on either way. Yep. The following night. Great. Okay. Any other business is meeting meetings? Any minutes to? Uh Do we have mini minutes in the one before that? Yeah. Okay. We'll look at it next time. Okay. Um, Motion to adjourn. Second. And we're adjourned.